Okay, welcome to program five of Blood Sweat, uh, Service UK's podcast. Um, I'm really enjoying doing these, and that's why I've continued to do it. And this week, I've moved away from actually talking to somebody I know really well, which is my friends out of my comfort zone, and I've moved to a guy called Sam Thompson. Now, I saw Sam Thompson through um, social media on his Instagram page, and I really enjoy what Sam puts up. He's a Scottish guy up in Ireland. No, he's a, sorry, he's a Cumbrian guy up in the Scottish Highlands. And I contacted him last week and said, Sam, I know we don't know each other, uh, but you are a bit of a podcast legend. Um, can you come on and have a chat with us and tell us a bit about what you're doing? I haven't been up to Scotland for about six months. Uh, and uh, so, Sam, how are you? Very well, thank you, mate. Um yeah, just in the, as I was saying to you just a minute ago, just in the middle of a of a blizzard, which is never a particularly good thing to be saying on what are we, the 9th of April. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, we've had, we had just this, the break of spring uh, about a week ago and everything was lovely and warm and very summery and then uh, got hit with another load of snow. So uh, we've got about three inches of snow on the ground outside. Um, well, we, we've some- had exactly the same, but I think you've had it, to the power of 10 because we had uh, the week, was it last week? No, the week before we had that lovely warm snap where we were all out in the garden. I was back on my allotment, you know, put all my blooming seeds in my greenhouse and everything. And since then we've had zero temperatures or ones and twos every night. And it's just nothing. It's just horrible at the moment, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, it's just not what you need no. And um, yeah, I think it'll be, we'll have some fairly cold, fairly cold deer. And after the winter we had as well, that's um, that's not going to be the best for them. But um, yeah, there's not a lot to be done about it, sadly. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, can't can't complain. Like um, like I think probably everybody in our industry, we had quite a quite a mixed season. Um, I should I should probably explain what I do. That'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, so I uh, I am a uh, like a contract stalker is the simplest way. Uh, I've been doing this for about six years. Um, before that, I was I was employed and um, working on estates, doing it before. But um, yeah, so I, I basically um, work seasonally with different estates. Uh, it's all open hill red deer stalking that I do, really. Um, I do a little bit of forestry work when I have to, but my my real passion is, uh, is open range red deer stalking and management. Um, so most of my most of my years sort of geared around that. August through to, to mid February time uh, in the stalking season, uh, and then the rest of the year I do other bits of work on contract, made a bit of grass keeping through the springtime and in the early summer, uh, and then uh, have a, a bit of an easier summer time, and then back to it by uh, by July August. So that's that's what I do. And this which is area? Quite, quite which, normally. Sorry, so which area do you focus on? You said you were near to Inverness is that is that where your stalking's based or are you uh... yeah so I I we live uh in a place called Akhnashin um which is uh the easiest way to describe it is probably if you drew a line from Inverness uh, on the east coast to the Isle of Skye on the west coast we're about yeah. halfway along that line um yeah. so we get we have the west coast climate Akhnashin in Gaelic means the field of rain yeah, which uh, yeah, which can be challenging at times. And um, so I, I live here. I do a little bit of work around here stalking, uh, but my main stalking contract the last two years has been uh, down on an estate near Fort William. So still on the west coast, just about two hours south of here. Uh, yeah. So I sort of moved down there for seven months of the year uh, yeah. and, and stalk there. And we, between myself and the uh, the, the head stalker, we shoot. Uh, about 50, 60 stags a year and about 150 hinds. And that's wow. all, um, it's not all done, sorry. All of our stags are done with clients, ideally. Uh, and then normally we would have stalking guests from the end of stag season at the 20th of October through until Christmas to do the hind uh, cull with us. And that last couple of months of the hinds, we, we do ourselves. So it's um, it's a fantastic place, really nice estate. Um, I get on really well with them and and it's, it's a nice place to work. So that's all you can really ask yeah. for. Beautiful. And so this year, that's you've had quite an impact with that, haven't you? Because, you know, in September, I was getting uh, messages and calls from Scottish estates saying, have you got any clients? As all, as all their foreigners started pulling the plug, you know, um, and, and um, but suddenly the people that were booking obviously uh, couldn't come over because they, you know, they got this issue with not travelling uh, in Europe. Uh, has that impacted on them? Did you end up shooting a lot of stags as part of the call yourself? 
Um, it was, we were very fortunate in that compared to some estates, uh, a, a near neighbor of ours here, uh, they let out of the 50 stags, they'd normally do a clients. They did two last year. Um, oh, and we were really lucky that we, our stag season wasn't as badly affected, um, mainly because it was smaller parties and they were generally UK based, um, which was good. I don't know whether it was fluke or whether it was just people pulling out earlier in the year, but we, uh, w- most of our cancelled clients had cancelled before we started. Um, so we kind of knew what we were in for. Um, I, we probably only managed just over half the stag call were clients, I would say, this year. I, I shot quite a few stags myself, uh, as did uh, Ian, the other stalker. Um, and then our hind season, uh, client stalking this hind season was virtually non-existent. I think we did. I think we did two weeks and then the English lockdown came into force. Yeah. Uh, and just as is the nature with um, Scottish hill stalking, I think if if 90% of your clients are English, that's fair. There's always a few. We always get a few local. Everywhere I've worked, in the most part, we've had a few local guys come stalking, especially at Hines. Yeah. And a few guys will come up from Edinburgh and Glasgow. But, yeah. but generally, the majority of people are coming south of the border and travelling. So uh, we, did, we did basically all the Hines ourselves. Um, which is a bit of a funny, it's a bit different actually, because I, I don't know about yourself, after you've done a big stint with clients through the stag season, in my case, and then you get to hinds, quite often you, you're you almost a bit resentful of those hind clients because you just like to be getting on and doing it. Whereas yeah. it, was the other, it was the other way around this year that because we did the stags and then didn't have any hind clients, um, it was almost, it got to about December time and I was like, God, I'm quite bored of being on my own now. <laughs> quite lonely, just cutting out every day and shooting deer. And we had really hard weather as well, um, which uh, which always sort of compounds that isolation. And it's not a bad thing, but it, it it's it's hard to see. It's hard to see the other businesses struggling up here. You know, yeah. our tourism industry has just been so incredibly hard hit, and yeah. hotels, and you know, people I've dealt with B and B's and holiday cottages that you've been putting clients to for a good while and you've got a good reputation with them and their business is now really on the yeah. bones of itself. On and, the bones, yeah, yeah, yeah it's absolutely. It, it, it's the same all over the place and it just makes me very glad I don't own a hotel, I think. Well um, I think try, I tried to book a, a a bed and breakfast in Perthshire that I use uh, and um they wouldn't take me booking. They'd write me name in the book uh, for the last week in September and they were they just haven't got any clue of what to do or, you know, they'd normally be, first thing they'd be doing was having your card and having a deposit on. <laughs> Absolutely. They'd, they'd done it last year and had to return so much. I think they decided that until they know that my name's in the book and that's good enough for us. So it, yeah. It, it has been I think, I think that's how, that's how a lot of us are operating with our stalking bookings as well, just because the, the giving back deposits is, is fairly hard business oh. at the best of times. And after like say a year of doing it, everybody's just a bit cautious. Um, yeah. But I'm hoping we, I'm hoping we have some sort of report because I, I was speaking to a, a, another stalker actually this morning about it. And, you know, there's a lot of estates that perhaps have been lucky enough to stand a year of lost income uh, on what's on the bank or in some cases up here, certainly, you know, a lot of these places are run as passion projects by the owner. So they yeah. can put in a bit more money to to cover some costs, but you know, if you think the amount of people that can afford to do it once is is a lot a lot more than the amount of people that can afford to do it twice. Yeah. So I'm really hoping we have we have some sort of return to normality for this stalking season because it is going to be very hard as otherwise. And it, and it's directly linked, isn't it? The, the the sporting asset of these huge estates, the revenue it brings in, the bit of revenue it brings in. I know it pays the wages and stuff like that, but it does have to filter out and do the conservation as well. It's part of it, isn't it? You, the, the stalkers and the gillies and the um, the keepers, yeah, they all play the part in the conservation of there. So it's a massive part. And and you do uh, like yeah. paying customers to, 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 to keep the income in, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, if, if you look at any business, the, the parts of it that are probably cut first in, a, in an economic situation are the the superfluous things which um you know in an estate situation maybe aren't the 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 day-to-day you know your staffing costs are are very dear to you and um we're very lucky in the highlands that in the most part you know owners are um are quite committed to it and you know they they tend to look after those of us that that work for them but um it's little things like you know i I spoke to one estate who I, i know and um 
you know, they, they were what the, the thing that they couldn't afford to do anymore, sadly, was their Red Squirrel reintroduction project that they've been working on. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, there's a lot of, we, we, we have a, a legal obligation for deer management. We have, uh, you know, if, if we stop controlling predators and there's, there's farming yeah. aspects, then they suffer. And, you know, all of those, all of those sides of it sort of have to keep going. Um, but, you know, the bosses, the boss's real show off project, the thing he was really pleased with and keen to do with his own bit of pocket money, if you like, Yeah. that, you know, and that doesn't bring him releasing red, red squirrels is, is not going to do any part of anything, any good other than his own happiness and yeah. the biodiversity of the place. But that's what suffers. And um, hopefully yeah. we get some sort of, um, some sort of return this year and uh, things can roll on a bit, but um, it does make you wonder how, um, and I imagine we'll get onto some sort of politics later because we inevitably do with these things. But um, <laughs> it, it, I think it does just make you realise that it's a very fragile economy. These these places, um, and, and there isn't a great, you know, there isn't a, a sort of a great uh, a great profit making to them at the best of times. No. So you know, and you, and not that I'm against rewilding at all, really, because I don't really know what it is. But um, uh, you. You you do wonder how they will cope um, when they're looking at having no income at all from from their their sort of natural capital. Um, yeah, I, yeah it's, it's a fascinating uh, bit of a view into what we might end up with in the yeah. future. Yeah, like I say, hopefully, hopefully this year coming we get a return to to multi multi households sharing accommodation, which is the really key thing for lodge lettings. Yeah, um, and uh, and if we've got that. Uh, then I think we'll be able to go ahead because last season all of our stalking was socially distanced and uh, you know yeah. the final crawl in we we had uh, very the, the very nice uh, ladies in the estate office provided us with some uh, some camouflage face masks oh, for our final approach so we were very <laughs> trendy when we were sneaking up on the day absolutely sort of yeah. like a buff bandana but a bit more a bit more official uh, yeah. so we'll be able to do that again no doubt. Um, and uh, as long as as long as people can book accommodation and they can travel up here, yeah. uh, then we'll we'll be all right. But um, the one good well, thing I've, I think that's maybe done. I've is tried it's... booking stags in Scotland, and uh, well, I've, I've got my normal places to go. But I think I spoke to you uh, day before yesterday with regards to doing this podcast, and I said, "Oh, you ain't got any stags," and you said, "Oh, you you booked out and got forty more names, haven't you?" Which is it's incredible. Oh, it's, yeah, we've got such a demand, and, and it is it, it, it is an international demand as per usual this year. Yeah. Um, I certainly, um, not to be all Brexity about it and, and far from it being anything political, but I think we have tried to get, uh, uh, we've tried to prioritise local bookings just because we can imagine travel restrictions. Yes. Um, but I have been um, shocked by the amount of international um, international inquiries we've had. And uh, and I think, yeah, it says a lot for our, our product, if you like, that people are, you know, wanting to commit and wanting to put deposits down and wanting to book in advance but, on but something I that also, they know is potentially in jeopardy. I uh, I also think with the European hunter, it's like um, them with my row books. They're the only ones that really understand the value of it. And for all the English lads that are stalkers that are listening, they're you know they they hate me for saying these things, but it, it, it's. It comes at a cost, doesn't it, deer stalking? And um, the rents are high, and and you have to um, you have to make a return on it. And if you're a Scottish estate, and we discussed the other day when I discussed costs, and I said, "How much is a stag now? Five, six hundred pounds?" And you told me if you got your way, you'd be happy with it being a thousand pounds. And you know, and I think the foreigners, um, the guys. Example: the Danish, the Dutch, who haven't got huge areas for hunting and access to it, really used to happy to travel. A um, thousand pound for a red stag, albeit a cull animal, is acceptable, and they'll pay it every day. You know what I mean? And, and uh, it's a difficult one for, for 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 English stalkers to get their head around paying that kind of money for shooting a relatively cull animal. But everything has its cost, doesn't it? And you getting out on the hill, you know. I think you said you use a garran, the pony out on the hill. There's, there's two or three people out there involved in the day, isn't there? Oh, it's it's a it's a fascinating. I think um, I think we have a really unique take on it in this country, and it's probably when I when I started my career, uh, sort of a dozen years ago, whatever it was, it was it wasn't uncommon for people to be paying ninety pounds for a day's hind stalking. 
Um, and you still get people saying, oh, well, hind stalking should be 120 quid. Um, and, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I think there's two, the two tangents of that is there's a Forestry Commission study, which is a few years old now, definitely. Um, uh, and I seem to remember them, the, the result of this financial study into the cost of deer management was it being somewhere in the, in the, in the region of 370 to 400 pounds of cost to them per animal shot. Um, you know, that is purely a yep. man going out and killing a deer for the sake yep. of deer management and yep. it's costing them that money. Um, yep. So when people are selling stags for 450 quid uh, and if they're trying to price in the time you spend on the phone and on emails getting that booking, you, yep. you, you're you not cost positive. Um, no. And the other thing that I, I, you know, I'm obviously as I, as I would, as I have to be in my uh, position, I'm, I'm a big proponent of what we do here. I think it's very special. And when I speak to a friend of mine who's uh, a, a hunting guide in Wyoming, and he talks about a, a Dal sheep hunt, which is a ten day hunt, I think, yeah, and 12, ten or twelve day hunt, small uh, family house, <laughs> and it's seventy five thousand dollars. <laughs> um, I'm there going a oh, thousand quid a stag's pretty cheap, isn't it? Really, yeah, yeah. you know. And I think um, you know it, American hunters. Uh, and this probably ties in with what we'll talk about later as well. But like, like you say, I think if English lads started viewing, uh, and not just English, Scottish people, everybody, you know, domestic clients, let's call them that. Yeah. Um, yeah. If they started viewing Highland stag stalking in the way that uh, Americans or Canadians viewed those high end, uh, yeah. low, low quantity uh, hunts in the in the sort of in the back country. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they'd maybe understand it a bit more because, uh, you know, all right, we're not helicoptering people in, but um, our no. costs are in high. Like you say, to get yourself a half decent Garen is probably 10,000 quid in, in investment in a horse. Yeah. Um, a, a saddle now is a, a good friend of mine, um, a stalker just two estates to the west of me, uh, is a is a, a full saddle making leather worker uh, who who makes very, very rarely now, but but can make a full traditional deer saddle. Um, and that's five or six thousand pounds for a saddle. Yes. Um, you know, so you think about the horse costing some money, and then you think the bit of leather you chuck on its back yeah. costs most, yeah. you know, costs as much as most people would spend on a quad bike. Yeah. Um it's it's just not a cheap, it's just not a cheap way of doing things. And you know, we're we're lucky, like that's I say, the cost I always, of tradition, isn't it? it? It is, and and it's also the the interesting thing with the horse is um because of the environmental pressure and now I think will hopefully um see them coming back to a few more places because yeah you know Arga cat tracking and, and wheelings from quad bikes and all these things are, are a fair eyesore on the hill and um nature yeah. scott is what uh, used to be called snh which is the the public body for for the environment in scotland they're getting quite hot on it now and um yeah, yeah horses horses leave very little impact uh, yeah. and i must admit just on a personal note it's a much oh, more it's pleasant great. day um, it is walking, great, home, yeah. walking home behind a horse than bouncing your aid off a mountain on an argocat. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to say they were safer because they can be fairly dangerous themselves, but so can argocats. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a funny environment to operate in and it, its challenges are what make it very special. But likewise, in my opinion, I think it's what should make it a premium product. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, well, I... we're at a very interesting time with it, definitely. I ha I've shot stags probably three years ago on um, uh, Athol, uh, and they um, had ponies there for the ex stag extraction in September. That came part of the lodge that I was a guest of. And then I had clients on, oh, goodness, what was the estate called? Drummond. And, uh, and you could pay extra for that. But uh, it was about 100 quid. Uh, and there was a group of French guys there, and they paid it, and they said it was the best part of the day. But like a yeah. hundred quid for the pony to be there for the day, it's, that's such a loss, isn't it? It's, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's you, you can understand uh, everybody's cost aware and looking at it. But, um, yeah, it's it's a difficult one. And and it's if it's sustainable and, and, and the rents go up or the costs of everything, where you live, the amount of diesel it costs to get around the blooming islands of scotland you know what i mean you go whenever Absolutely. I'm constantly looking at me blooming fuel gauge to make sure we've got half a tank because we, <laughs> on on many occasions we've like got to the fuel station and it's blinking well shut 
<laughs> oh, I told you Absolutely. it was a Monday. <laughs> what? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but anyway. It's a very different. I am... Um, yeah, you get. I, I've been up here a long time now, and you just get used to it. But when I have people come up, you know, people come up from down south, and they ring you up, and they're like, "Oh, we're at uh, we're at um, oh, down the middle, the, the big mountain pass on the A nine, and um, the fuel lights come on, and you, you sort of go, oh dear." And they say, yeah. "Well, where will we get petrol?" And you're like, "Well, just drive very slowly. Hopefully, you'll get here in time." Yeah. Um, but yeah, if it's uh, well, it does come with all those challenges. Yeah, it um, does. I think it's uh, it'll be it'll be a shame if it didn't have them because it's what makes it special. But um, yeah, it's certainly like you say, it can it can be difficult on a Friday night when you just want to get home. <laughs> yeah. Well, on part of your social media, I've written a few notes down here. I did read um, a link to an article you wrote uh, about William Scrope. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, what led you to write it is what I'm going to ask, but. Um, I thought the way you put it, I mean, he was an, an English guy in Scotland who was a sportsman, but he really got people thinking about actual hunting up there, didn't he? And the um, and the pleasure of hunting, be it um, fishing, yeah. shooting or stalking. And uh, I thought it was really good what you wrote. So um, oh, thanks. a listener he, doesn't know about it. Explain a little bit what led you to that. So it's a, it's, a funny, it's a funny thing because the – the angle that that, that was uh, printed in the, the American magazine, Modern Huntsman. Um, so it had a, a a bit of an international slant, perhaps, but I think it's still valid in that deer hunting history in Scotland, although um, the SNP especially enjoy telling us we've only been doing it since William Scrope. Actually, it goes back six to 8,000 years we've been chasing deer about. Yeah. Um, but he was really definitely not the first. But he was one of the he was the first person that wrote about um doing this for fun. He was the first person that went deer stalking for its own merit rather than because he was hungry. Yeah. Um and it, 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 the, the key in that is the deer stalking because there'd been deer hunting. Um you read about the the great um the great deer drives that King James uh, had put on where um uh, the people, the beating line started at essentially the east end of the Cairngorm National Park, as we have it now, and finished on the A9 <laughs> after six days of driving deer. Uh, I think that was James the Fourth. But um, you know, the, William Scrope was the first person that, um, in, in a time where it, it, it was fascinating for a number of reasons, and it's it's a period of time that I find very interesting because you have these guys who are generally aristocratic Englishmen. Um, yeah going to what was really, you know, this is the later part of the 18th century. Um, it, it's sort of 30 years after the, the last Jacobite uprising. It's yeah. it's it's kind of the equivalent of being like, ah, yeah. Owen, there's some, there's some really cool deer in Hellmand. Shall we go, <laughs> we go and try and shoot some deer in Hellmand? It looks like yeah. sunny. We'll go there. I and, think you know, in the, on the article you said to Jackistan or something like. Yeah, well, it, it really was. You know, it was it was a, it was a country that spoke. It was part of Britain, right enough. But at the same time, two thirds of the world was, yeah. was at that time, and you know, the, it was a different language. It, I think I think I worked out that Fort George, which is the the huge fort um, in Inverness or, or near Inverness, Ardsia, which they reckon is uh, the, the pinnacle of defensive engineering, which ironically has never been attacked. Um, <laughs> But like the real pinnacle of castle building, if you like, yeah. that was finished like four years before William Scrope came stalking up here. So it's like four yeah. years after we were building this this huge military base because we were terrified of the local people, up turns William Scrope, Scrope with his flintlock and his peregrine falcon yeah. to see what he can go hunting. Um, yeah. So he he was a fascinating guy for a number of reasons. Um, and I think what he was doing was probably a lot, had a lot more in common with what guys are doing in Tajikistan now than yeah. what we do here. He yeah. was, um, you know, he was going around with a, a heap of local guys as sort of Sherpas, uh, which has evolved into Gillies, which is the yeah. Gallic word for a boy. That's where that comes from. Uh, he was hiring the local village uh, to carry all his stuff. And he would go into the hills for, for weeks at a time with, with his rifle, with his shotgun, with his hawks, with his fishing tackle. And, you know, his, his game bag was essentially anything that moved. Um, <laughs> and, and sort of from that, he wrote this book. He he, he had a, a, on the Athol estate that you were talking about earlier, he had the first sporting lease, I think, in Scottish history uh, on the Forest Lodge beat and, and one of the other beats of Athol. 
Uh, and from that, he he wrote this um, this book uh, called The Art of Deer Stalking, um, which was, he, yep. he wrote two books in his life. The other one was called uh, Days and Nights of Salmon Fishing on the River Tweed. Um, that would have been uh, in the early, early 1800s then, wouldn't it? Uh, he, he started going to Scotland, I believe, in the late 18th <laughs> century, sort of, 1780 something like that and like oh, i say jacobite rebellion was 1745 really not long ago yeah um so in fact maybe he started going earlier than that and i think uh i have a second copy of his book and i think that was printed in 1812 um and by by 1800 it, it was it, it traveled very quickly uh and they're phenomenal books to read if you're interested if you're interested in hunting of any type but if you're yeah. interested in scottish deer stalking and, and the history of it the books by him uh and a chap called augustus grimble who was really the second guy to come along and write books about it and charles sinjan and, and these people um th- th- they are fascinating because they're it, it's such a it's such a sort of um such a new thing for them there's no yeah. you know th- this was a time before there was professional stalkers so this was unguided hunting yeah. that was doing in areas that they had no map of they yeah. didn't speak the local language and there was no roads yeah. and you know yeah. th- they were just sort of beetling off getting yeah. off the train and going and seeing what they could shoot and yeah and yeah. very quickly it involved more into you know as as all things do people require them to be comfier and easier so yeah. lodges got built and, you know, more railway lines and, and professional stalkers were employed. And there's just some amazing writing from that period of time. And, and, it, and it's also, it's interesting to to read things where, you know, they were they were pretty convinced that deer were living 200 years. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, this, this was sort of taken as science that like, oh, yeah. this, this, this stag is 150 years old. Um, and you just realise that actually, you know, we're not a great deal later on. It's not been going awfully, uh, an awfully long time. And okay. um, it, it's evolved so much in that time. But yeah, well, Scrope, uh, Scrope is someone that you, I think you have to admire for his, um, just the way he went about things and his um, his dedication to, uh, there's a, I, I wish I, if I had it in front of me, I would be able to read you some cracking quotes, but um, you know, his, his sort of, his real, um, his his want to do something that was truly challenging yeah. and really very uncomfortable. Um, and that was, you know, that was what it, he didn't want to hunt to hounds like everybody else did in the right. south of England. He didn't want to shoot um, grouse over pointers. He wanted to crawl up and down burns in a kilt and, you know, fair play to him. He, he and uh, and, and you can imagine that I've no, that the boots would be like obnail boots, wouldn't they? You know, oh, I think um, the, the, no the, the great, um <laughs> There's some great. This is what's actually. This is one of the things that I love so much about about the Highlands and and Highland sporting history, especially is William Scopes. Scopes great get sort of gamekeeper, if you like, in inverted commas, who was called a forester at the time because obviously estates are still to a degree known as deer forests. Yep. Um, which is um, well, this is just a very boring side note, but it's actually not a forest. Um. Everybody talks about deer forests and they assume this is to do with the Caledonian forest and the fact there would have been a lot of trees and we cut them all down. And it's not really true. Forest is a um, is a dilution of the Gallic word foras. And, and foras is the Gallic word for a barren wasteland. Ah. Um, so a forester was a man that was in charge of, of this big, big expanse of nothing, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and his, so Scrope's gamekeeper, who was a chap called Gro- John Creera, um, he is the uh, he 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 started a line of careers that were at Athel and 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 are still there. And my fiance's uh, best friend uh, is a careerer from Athel, uh, and they've really? a direct line of five generations, I think, to her from John Careerer. So it's a very recent history, and it's you know he was they were sort of tying leather to their feet, talking about the boots they were wearing. It was more like oh. moccasins. And yeah. they were wearing in, in America at the time, you know, it was incredibly primitive and um yeah and very humble in that regard. I think it it they must, the they whole, must have uh, been such a tough breed of people to live up there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's D- a tough, a tough breed of people. And even until relatively recently, I, there's a, a fantastic book um called Isolation Shepherd, which was ri- written by a chap called Ian Thompson. Uh, who lived at a place um, called West Mona, which is um, at the back of Glen Strathfarrow. And he he talks about um, when they were clipping sheep, 
sending that his predecessor would send the housemaid to walk 20, 22 miles uh, to buy sugar and tea. Um, and I've been in that country, and that's not like 22 miles along a road. That's 22 no. miles of Munros and, you know, fording rivers and brutal, brutal. You know, if I took a stalking client on a day like that, I imagine about half of them would die. Yeah. And they were just like, oh, well, we, we're clipping sheep and we're going to have people round, so we better have some sugar and we'll send the 13-year-old maid by herself in her dress. And off she, you know, and off she go. And that was, it, it was, a, it was a, a different breed of people. Well, that, uh, and I, I look at what I do now and it's just, it's a world apart. When you're out on the hill uh, in, in many areas, you'll come across like the, the remains of an old bothy or something. Uh, yeah. And that was just a place for them to... To, 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 to live temporarily for a few months and the missus would bring you up a bit of food sort of like once a week on a Saturday or something mm-hmm. like stop the night and then go back down to the big house or whatever. Um, it must Yeah, have- I mean, pre, um, pre sort of highland clearances, most, most populations in the highlands lived in a different place in the summer to the winter and yeah. they would go um, up to summer pastures on high and they'd live in shielings all summer and then they'd come down in the winter. Um, yeah. But yeah, and you, you hear those stories of you know when they started um, when they started the sort of the, the real drive for sporting estates and uh, for grouse and for deer in different places. You, you hear these stories of of the sort of the very famous Sutherland fox catchers who were essentially like the best terriermen that there must have been, and they would they would take to the hill for a week or two at a time with a kilt and a bag of porridge oats and some dogs. And they'd go and kill foxes and they'd be paid a bounty for killing foxes. Like you say, living in shielings and caves and, you know, Whatever just they could. in a very similar way to those sort of frontiersmen you hear about in America or Australia yeah. or wherever. Scotland yeah. was pretty much that wild at that point in time, yeah. Um, yeah. which is, yeah. And then you think about it today and I go to the hill with my bloody um, GPS in reach thing in case I fall off a quad bike and, <laughs> It, you know, I can talk to my mate on the radio and I can put a picture on Instagram and you're just like, Jesus, yeah. it's, not even, it's not even vaguely the same job that it no. was 50 years ago. Um, no. But no, it's, it's, it's certainly interesting. I think you can, the, the history, in, even in, in individual estates, the, the history is so fascinating and the people that have been involved and the characters and um, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a huge part of it that I think people uh, often skip by. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you. And, and, and you get people, you know, Alec, Alec McDonald, who's down at um, uh, Lock Eel, um, uh, Lock Eel Estates down uh, near Fort William. You know, he's a third or fourth generation on the same bit of ground. Um, you know, yeah. there's very few places on earth, I would imagine, where you have that level of, of local knowledge in, in any yeah. sort of guide, uh, yeah. let alone a hunting guide. And um, Yeah, that's really special. That's something we need to be need to be looking after, I think, and promoting rather than. Incredible history, and the, yeah. and you know the deer population over that. Well, you know, if we, I think about my lifetime, I listened about Scottish deer populations, about it being too high and, and gone from the estates that weren't really managing them, and the, you know the, the BBC News perhaps ten years ago where they were filming red deer under a wall, or you know, and I saw that thing you put on Instagram about um, Basque's proposition to um, to get competent um, recreational stalkers into the forest. And, I, and I, again, I've, I've got, I say I pulled a little piece off. It's the uh, Basque's um, letter to the Scottish Parliament for the election 2021 uh, manifesto for sustainable shooting. I'll just read it to you. And I just wonder what your comments were on it. This is Basque's um, uh, note to them. And it says, it's our view that the management of deer by contractors on behalf of statutory bodies is not an effective use of public funds given that Scotland is home to an abundance of qualified recreational deer stalkers keen to harness stalking opportunities. Moreover, we do not believe that extensive use of licences by statutory bodies to permit out-of-season culling and night shooting are synonymous with Scotland's resolute commitment to maintaining high standards of animal welfare. We propose that Scotland rethinks its approach to deer management on public land we advocate for a management approach which treats deer as a natural asset that increases public participation in management and that champions venison as a healthy, sustainable meat in line with the Scottish venison, venison 
strategy. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's um, uh, a great statement from Bass because, you know, it's kind of a lot of Scottish estates. It's our ball and we're going to play football with it. And the, there's people out there that are competent and capable and um, and aren't just a weekend. They're beyond a weekend stalker. And and will put the time in and the graft and shoot something sportingly in daylight hours and following a, 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 a plan laid out perhaps by somebody um, that's professional. What's your opinion on that, Sam? Um, I think there's a real. It's a very. We're at this um, absolutely fundamentally crucial time. I think for 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 deer management in Scotland, but also a very interesting one. Um, we the, the 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 recent publication of the uh, deer working group uh, their report, which was published last year, and about three weeks ago, um, Scottish government responded to that with a. Uh, a sort of on a number of their recommendations. I think there was 84 recommendations by that working group. I think the government accepted in principle 99% of them. Um, that report, um, I mean, we could do 10 podcasts and still not cover <laughs> that report. In Podcast 106. Detail. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's still him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, 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 you know, the, 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 what they talked about was, was um, huge. Uh, it covered a whole different breadth of things across the sector. Some parts of it um, I fundamentally agreed with. Um, and some parts of it I fundamentally disagreed with. And I think... Uh, I'm probably in the majority of, of people in my industry of deer management uh, up here that would be in that case in that most of us can agree that upskilling of our sector and increasing scientific data collection in deer management is all good. Uh, and also the fact that put, putting a, a density of deer blanket across Scotland is a really stupid idea. Um, and it, it's, it's a very complicated thing. That working group report is... Um, uh, just uh, yeah, more a lot more to it than um, than what Basque have pulled out in that statement and what we'll talk about today, yeah. uh, which is the right way to do it. But um, Basque's statement, I think, is certainly spurred on by that. Yeah. Um, I, I I've, I've been an open critic of Basque in the past. Very yeah. happy to say so. Um, I've been on podcasts, not with yourself, but I was on Byron Pace's podcast a yeah. couple of years ago and fairly kept, kicked up a stink. Um, and I think I think that's good. I think a healthy level of criticism uh, is is good in in anything in life. Totally. Um, I, but equally, I you know I relatively recently wrote for the Basque magazine about copper ammunition, um, and I've been more impressed with their with with this uh, latest manifesto and their their uh, the article that they put in the Times, uh, which is what I responded to on Instagram. Uh, than by by much anything else that Basque has done recently. Um, and when I say recently, in, in my lifetime of, of, of involvement in, in shooting, which is most of my life, um, public land hunting is uh, something that um, I have been thoughtful of for probably about five or six years. Um, I think I first openly sort of talked about it in about 2016 um uh which might have been on a podcast or might have been at a, a, at a, at a, a game fair panel thing i don't know people occasionally ask me to do things like this lovely podcast and i do wonder why sometimes but um yeah i've been banging on about this for a while um and yeah. i'm far from being the proponent of it there's you know my thoughts on it have been um influenced by a lot of people i've worked with and people i know through the industry um and and i start with the point and i always do this that whenever we bring up um, the public hunting on publicly owned land and the, uh, the Scottish government through its, its agencies, Nature Scott and Forest and Land Scotland, which is what we used, to, what we now call the Forestry Commission. So I might use those terms between each other because I'm yet to get my head around the change. But, yeah, you know, yeah. that's what happens when people spend four million quid rebranding or however much they spend. Um, uh, so... Yeah, the biggest landowner in Scotland is the public, yeah. uh, and yet our access to to public hunting on that land is is really small. Um, the only real public access for non professional uh, involvement is through uh, leases and syndicates, 
which yeah. he used uh, essentially as little as possible is what I would say. Yeah, uh, I, and I should that point out that I'm not uh, I'm not an expert in forest and land Scotland deer management. I have a reasonable idea about it. Um, I know a lot of people that I would consider experts in it, and they've certainly influenced a lot of my opinions. Um, so my first point is that we've got all this public land and no public. We, we've got access for every sort of recreation on it, but not hunting. You can go mountain biking on it. You can go paragliding on it. You can go horse riding. You can do whatever you like within, you know, within the law, uh, but you can't go hunting. And I think that's fairly unique in the Western world. Um, it obviously, and we could, again, we could devote an entire podcast into the history of land and hunting in the UK, which would in some ways be interesting, but would be very boring to a lot of people. <laughs> and essentially, because of how our history has evolved with hunting forests and yada, 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 we don't have that same uh, system that they do. Uh, and the obvious examples, America and Canada, but also in, in parts of Norway, in parts of Iceland, we can sit and list countries left, right and centre that yeah. do have public land hunting. We don't. Um, the common reasons that are, I am told that wouldn't work are because it would be dangerous, uh, that it's too small here, uh, and that uh, there aren't enough uh, skilled people to do a good job. So that that, that in the ballpark yeah. is why people yeah. immediately shoot down the idea. Yeah. And whenever, um, until relatively recently, like I say, the last five or six years, I was sort of quite accepting of that because you are always ac- accepting of the status quo where you grow up and where you learn things. Yeah. Um, so that's the sort of first point. And, and that, I feel, is a social issue that we have to get our heads around. And um, The second point is just a practicality issue in that I don't think Forest and Land Scotland are doing a very good job of managing their deer. And I don't mean that in a deer management point of view. I mean that in their own aims and goals, there are some areas where they are on target with their deer management. They have target population densities. And there are other areas where they're vastly behind. Um, and that is th- their big accusations to throw around. But um, if you look at the count data and you but speak... But that'll, all be, that'll all be down to um, range of per acreage and uh, the resource of actually getting I mean, there to shoot them. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, it's a, a combination of, of factors, I think. Um, probably a little bit of a perfect storm in terms of uh deer management um or deer control as we refer to it in forestry situations because they're not interested in managing a deer population they're interested in controlling a deer population for timber production in the most part which is fine because in a forestry situation that's what you've got to do um i i think we've got a a system essentially that isn't working very well it also costs nine million pounds a year in scotland which is a lot of money for something to not work very well Yep. Uh, a lot of that cost is in contractors who are quite often paid a piece rate of uh, 90 pounds a deer is what is commonly quoted and it does vary but you're looking yep. at you know not insignificant amounts of money in some ways and not enough money in other ways yep. um yep. and then like you say you also have wildlife rangers which is the the forest land scotland name for a deer stalker or a deer controller yep. or whatever you yep. want to say who are employed people who control the deer um and there is also these leases and syndicates where the Forestry and Land Scotland PR team would tell you the public has access to deer management and therefore yeah. piss off with your questions. Yeah. Um, and that's very much the Forestry and Land Scotland's position on this. You see how yeah. I have to be careful to keep not saying the Forestry Commission, because again, we've had a rebrand recently and yeah. nobody's quite sure why, but there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we're in this situation where we've got a system that I think Anybody that is objective could say isn't delivering a lot of benefits. The majority of venison shot on the public estate is sold abroad by a very large game dealer. Um, And that's fine because that's sort of a cost, you know, that's how they do it. Um, But what you don't have is you don't have Does Ben Rigby run up to Scotland? Yes. No, it's not. It's Highland Game out of Dundee. Highland Game, yeah. Yeah, Christian, yeah. listen, uh, Highland Game has the contract for uh, FLS, as far as I'm aware, across Scotland. Yeah. Um, uh, so th- so we've got the situation where deer that are getting shot in North Highland region um, yeah. are getting shipped down to Dundee for processing and then quite often getting sold to uh, France or Spain or America or wherever the hell they sell. I mean, sh- I'm sure some of it ends up in Inverness, Tesco, but yeah. a lot of them doesn't. Um 
And I think if you objectively look at that system, a bit like, you know, I've said, I think it's healthy for anything, you you don't come out with that's the best solution. Yeah. Um, I think... I think there's, again, you can go around in circles about it, but I think we have a a, a disconnect between um, the the hunting industry, let's call it that, because it's not necessarily deer stalking, um, but we have a massive disconnect between that and commercial forestry deer control. Um, Like you say, a lot of it is carried out uh, legally using... uh, night license uh night licenses in scotland and out of season licenses um if you speak to people that carry out deer counts on the forestry commission ground uh which i do uh and if you spend some time yourself walking around these places you will often find that within probably 300 meters of a vehicle track on a lot of forestry land scotland ground and i'm not and this is the thing i've got you know i've got friends that are rangers i've got friends that are fls contractors yeah. Yeah. who are doing a good job i also know a lot of people that aren't and i think yeah. if those people looked at it objectively they'd agree with that but if you pick a vehicle track in an fls woodland and you walk along it you'll probably see very little deer sign within 300 more meters of where you can get a pickup truck yeah when you go past that three four hundred meters it does start to increase yeah. Uh, and that is often because we're pushing contractors to yeah. do the most cost efficient type of deer control over a large area. Yeah. And a lot of them see that as night shooting from a vehicle. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not arguing against that at all. That's what no. they want to do. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. In a lot of places that does deliver the deer control objectives, but in a lot of places it doesn't. What I would like to see, and this is where I suppose my little manifesto comes in um is why can't as well as contractors as well as as wildlife rangers as well as deer fencing you know this is our toolkit of deer control to grow trees why not also use recreational stalkers to a larger degree um all the point that the big point the thing that always comes back to me especially from people in the industry is that it's not safe these people aren't qualified. We can't have them walking around the public forest. And I always go back to um, the fact that if, if this is a forest in the land Scotland wood, and this is a privately owned wood, and in Scotland we have public access everywhere, we have a right to roam, yep. how are we endangering the public by allowing any Tom, Dick and Harry who can afford to buy it the right to shoot here, Yep. but somehow they're too dangerous to be here? The right answer, I think, is a higher level of training. I don't yeah. think that the deer management qualifications we have in this country are acceptable. I think, yeah. um, and that's the the interesting thing around the other changes that Basque have been involved in with the DMQ is that they've dropped the uh, the amount of, of uh, witness stalks. Yeah, I've seen yeah. that. Yeah, um, and, and I think we should be going the other way. I think we should be increasing training. We should be increasing yeah. education. We should be turning out recreational stalkers from our training system that are more than safe and capable of managing deer in any situation um, without it being a cause for concern. Um, And I think that's probably... Perhaps even issuing them with a hunting licence like they are in your... Well, and that's it. And I wouldn't be averse to that. I think there's a great... um, It's a. I think it's a Yeats quote, William Butler Yeats, the poet, who said that um, education is not filling a bucket but lighting a fire. Yeah. Um, and I I don't understand how the little industry that we're in, which is a little insignificant industry relative to the world, has become so desperately set against education. Um, you know, the amount of people you speak to who are so against carrying out qualifications, let alone having yeah. to redo them as part of CPD, yeah. is mind-boggling. Yeah. And then you speak to someone in like a proper industry, like the construction industry, where they're very tightly regulated, unlike us, yeah. and they just, you know, they all accept that they have to redo their professional qualifications every five yeah. years to yeah. make sure they're current. Somehow yeah. in this country, we've ended up with people that couldn't think of anything worse than being assessed. I don't know whether that comes from a point of people question their own competence and are too yeah. um, too arrogant to admit that they maybe could learn something. And, and, and the truth is, they don't need to question it because they're, you know, if I look at the majority of guys that come out with me, be it 
um, um, you know, rec recreational novices to people that are, um, you know, are, are serious novice shooters. They're all actually um, very safe. The Brits are very safe because they've been brought up with a game shooting, do not point your gun. Whereas a lot of the foreign lads have come over, have done all the tests and all the, you know, but they haven't perhaps had the practical experience that we've had of game shooting no. put in company. You know what I mean? Yeah. So generally the safety aspect is what we're really good at. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and I would I would agree with that. You know, traditionally we didn't have qualifications for it, but we had you know the the great poem about never let your that's it a father's never, advice never to be, his son. That's that's exactly the one. Well yeah. done. Good yeah. points for remembering there. But yeah, you know yeah. we have all of that, and we have a very low rate of accidents within our, our shooting sports, which yeah. we should be really proud of. Yes. Um. Um, and you know other com un other countries don't have that, and you know people are always saying, "Oh, people are getting shot every bloody week in America. They've got to wear orange to make sure they're safe." What 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 idiots? And yeah. you're like, "Well, yeah, but they've also got all this amazing opportunity." And yeah. I would quite happily wear an orange hat if I was a recreational stalker to have access to a load of ground that I wouldn't otherwise do. Yeah, um, I, 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 think I think we're in this we're in this really weird situation where we have. More and more people, you know, more and more of my clients, which are a very small sample of, of the industry, but I have more and more people every year that come to me that want to go deer stalking who've never done it before. And not only have they never done it before, they don't come from any background of it either. Nope. You know, I had a team of guys at Early Stags this last season, and there was a guy who works for a coffee pod company, an accountant from a big accountancy company in London, a personal trainer. None of them came from a hunting background. None of them had ever had a member of family or friends get involved with hunting. And what that had happened is they had all watched Meat Eater on Netflix for Stephen yeah. Ella, and they all thought, that looks really cool. I want to yeah. do that. Yeah. And so, however, they ended up, they found me, and they ended up coming up here. They were up for three or four days. They had a really great time. Um, they shot some deer. They took some venison home. They, they took it. some venison home. That's the thing, isn't it? And, and, and this is this, this is link. another big secondary point of mine. And this is something I'm really pleased that um, going forward, I can offer my clients because we've got a game dealer's license. My clients will be able to take butchered venison home. Yeah. Um, it's always been the way with traditional Scottish estates that the only venison you could buy would be a whole carcass in the skin. It's quite yeah. inconvenient if you drive up in your Audi A3 from London and yeah. you're going back to your flat in Notting Hill and you've got 85 kilograms of venison stuck in the stuck in the back of your picker. Like it just Draw, doesn't make sense. Crawling with kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know we've got this. We've got this really weird system. Uh, and you look right. Okay, how do they address that in other parts of the world? Well. There's accessible public land hunting with a real focus on a harvest of, of meat for, for people's own table. Yeah. Um, and I'm sitting there going, that would answer, you know, take away deer management in the public estate and the fact that yeah. I don't think that's as effective as it could be. But let's look at the, the shooting world and let's look at the issues we have, especially around deer, deer stalking and especially around uh, the, the recruitment of people into deer stalking. Um, and it's, terrifying if i look at my friend group you know i'm i'm late 20s i look at my friend group who are predominantly people in their mid 30s to their mid 20s of my friends that aren't involved in this industry directly virtually none of them have access to, to deer stalking yep. and it's predominantly cost it's predominantly yep. opportunity you will know far better than i will earn that you know down in your part of the world um, while there is probably quite a lot of publicly owned forest, I think there's 40, is the 46,000 he hectares in the southeastern forest district alone? I think I read oh, once. What? Even I it's don't know. It's a huge that. amount I mean, of forest it's, it's, I, I could only talk lo locally, but there's uh, there's 15,000 acres near to us, Canic Chase, uh, and there's no, there's, there's I think there's three rangers covering that. And um, very nice chaps they are, by the way. Uh, yeah. uh, and, th and this is it. They, they're they're right. on a hide into nothing, you know, but it isn't. I mean, Canic Chase is not a good example. It's 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 crawling with people, bikes, and, and, and especially yeah. in the current environment um, during the lockdown, it, it's, it's been horrendous. And it's actually pushing the deer off the chase and into the surrounding farms. and Where, where they're probably getting managed by people that don't do it for a living. 
So, exactly. and, th- yeah. and this is what I find really weird is we talk about this like, oh, well, they couldn't possibly be hunting on public land as yeah. if we didn't have public access on private land. Yeah. Whereas actually, you know, I remember being a 13, 12 year old lad, whatever age I was, cutting about with a 2 2 shooting rabbits on farmland with no qualification yeah. um, and nobody governing whether or not I could do it. And yeah. no, even not even any requirement legally for third party insurance. Yeah. So we have this like really weird dynamic that yeah. I think is really quite unhealthy because so many of the problems we face as a, as a community of, of hunting people, of shooting people could be solved with more younger people coming in yeah. at a lower price point. Yeah. You know, that's that's the thing we've been trying to get our bloody heads around, certainly in my lifetime, and haven't managed yet. And every other part of the world that we can look at for an example generally copes with that with a significant training and qualification okay. regime, proper yeah. education, and access to public land at a relatively low cost. You, you could and, look at that scheme on Aaron, the Basque run, and they've got one in Thetford as well. It's fully booked, isn't it? And yeah, absolutely. A, a good friend of mine was actually the the stalker guide for that Thetford scheme, and yeah. that wasn't cheap. You know, I think you were still a hundred quid for an outing or a hundred quid a day or whatever. Yeah, it was. You know, if, if you're a 20, 22 year old student, it's an unachievable price. Yeah, yeah. But you know, when Rob was there, he couldn't move for people wanting to come stalking yeah. in Thetford, and. Yeah. I think Basque have actually been really good with those schemes. And I think personally, I am intrigued to know how they ended up with Aaron. And I, I've no no knowledge of how it happened. It was before my time. Yeah. But that is essentially the worst place you could put a scheme like that. Because yeah. it's like, oh, if you want to come stalking, yes, you've got to pay for it. You've also got to get a ferry. There's a very limited amount of accommodation you book. It's yeah. almost as if someone in the Forestry Commission designed that for it not to work. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not but that anybody did. would be that political, but yeah. you know, we have lots of areas of publicly owned land that are relatively easy in yeah. terms of managing extraction, yeah. public safety, yeah. and ease of stalking. Yeah. These are the areas where probably contractors are making the most money at 90 quid an animal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But actually, why not? get the contractors and the wildlife rangers, the professionals with that level of skill set, why not get them to focus on the really challenging areas to manage deer, pay them more money per per animal they kill or increase the ranger footfall or whatever, make deer management in those areas more effective by giving the low hanging fruit to the people with the lower skill set. Yeah. and yes, it would mean we'd have to re reevaluate our training. I think that's a good thing across the board anyway, yeah. because while I completely agree with you, the, the inherent safety in British deer stalkers and British shooting people is very good. What I have always found a little bit scary is often their knowledge of the environment and of nature is lacking. Yeah. Um, and that's fine because you know, they're recreational stalkers. I don't challenge people that enjoy golfing to know what all the Latin names of the trees are on the golf course. <laughs> um, but I think when we're, when we're looking at this holistic approach and that like, right, okay, how do we allow people to take venison? How do we allow people cheap access to hunting? And how do we better educate people that can be reluctant in terms of better education, which is our own fault, but that's the situation we're in. So if you want someone to, if you want to increase the skill level of that hunting population, the the vast majority of which is 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 amateur, um, which I don't have a problem with. Uh, you know, I, I always talk about amateur deer stalkers or recreational deer stalkers. I, I don't think any less of them than professionals. It's okay. just a very different, um, a very different thing. You know, the the people like me that spend seven months of the year getting rained on, crawling about in ditches generally have a bit more experience than the guys that get out of the weekends, but it doesn't mean they're any less valuable in my opinion. Amateur is French for lover of, and what better person to be managing deer than people that are passionate about them. Um, But if you want them to spend money increasing their skill level, you need a carrot or a stick. And I think if the carrot could be affordable, um, local deer, stalking opportunities where there's no it doesn't matter whether they shoot the biggest stag in the forest yeah. or a two-year-old spiker they don't need to be expert deer managers that can you know age yeah. class hinds from 300 meters 
they need to know that any deer inside that area needs to be shot if it's in season. Yeah. Which suits the Forestry Commission down to the bloody ground. Yeah. And why not incentivize them to increase their training level to whatever yeah. we would find an acceptable standard? Yeah. Um, by giving them opportunities that they don't have at the moment. And then you've also got local venison being consumed locally with a very low carbon footprint, with very low food miles, and a very healthy meat being fed to a population that in the most part are desperately in need for food that isn't McDonald's. And the guy that shot it, the guy that shot it's yet another adversary and he's promoting it himself. Exactly, exactly. And I've, I've had this conversation, a really good friend of mine is an ecologist, He's in his early 30s now. Uh, he did a period of time working in New Zealand with, for their Department of Conservation. He's from relatively inner city, Birmingham. Uh, and he came back from New Zealand and was like, Christ, I, you know, I, I did a bit of hunting and it's, it's awesome. How do I go about it? Yeah. And you're like, oh, this is going to put you off. Well, you need to get a firearms license. Yeah. And then you need to start paying people to go and do it. Yeah. And yeah. That is a man who could have been a great advocate for what we love. He could have also been, in the fact that he is an incredibly fit mountain biking rock climber, a great asset for deer management in terms of the fact that he's really fit, he's really committed. And he is someone that will shoot a deer in a place that a ranger would not shoot a deer because they can't get a quad bike there because to get that stag out has to be time efficient for them. Yeah, he will shoot a deer there and take a day and a half carrying it out, like yeah. they do in America, like they do in New Zealand. If we if we get out of our box of how we do things in this country, there's all sorts of advantages to having people that aren't financially incentivized shooting deer when you need to shoot deer, yeah. and it isn't a simple process. I'm not suggesting that we can do this overnight. I'm not suggesting that this is going to halve the cost of deer management in Scotland, yeah. but I do think it's going to deliver a huge amount of public benefit. And at the same time, hopefully make deer management more efficient, which they're desperately in need of. Yeah. I don't yeah. really understand the downside to this. And I think the fact that Basque are, are on board with it shows that people who are at an organisation level who are a lot more used to the politics of these things than I am, yeah. the fact they're on board as well probably means that we're not on a hiding to nothing. Um, but it is it to, 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 to get anything like what we're talking about off the ground is obviously going to be a huge amount of work. I think the key thing if it's something that people like the sound of, you know, the guys that are listening to this podcast and girls, obviously, um, and the people that follow you on Instagram and all these other social media channels, you know, if we can get those people excited about this and thinking about this yeah. and in a position where they're going, Oh, actually I'll, I'll write to Basque. I'll send an email and say, how can I get involved? Or I'll just send an email to the forestry commission slating the hell out of them for how they do it at the moment. Yeah. The more voices we can get behind this, the better. Because the problem is the half a dozen guys that I might have a deep conversation with about this in the industry are only half a dozen voices. And yeah. in a lot of cases, they're half a dozen voices with a lot of experience and more knowledge than I have about these things. Um, but it's only half a dozen people. And yeah. we need to start pushing this like Basque have done. And I think it's such a great thing. They've yeah. got that article in a mainstream newspaper and they're really backing it up with their work. Um, you know, I think that's great. You know, and potentially I wonder if, that, uh, I wonder if uh, Sachs will pick that up. Scottish Association of Country Sports. Uh, I really hope so. You know, yeah. I'd love to see, I'd love to see the Scottish Country Sports Tourism Group pushing yeah. this. Um, and, you know, I don't think it does just have to be about local people. There's a lot more deer and a lot more ground up here than there is local people. Yeah. And I don't see why you couldn't have a visiting tag scheme as well as a local tag oh, scheme. Oh, a tag scheme. Oh, yeah. Why not? You know, yeah. we've got more, you know, Christ, that that little brick that sat next to yeah. me That's has it. all the capabilities of a GPS GIS system yeah. that could confine people with a booking system to an area of ground where they're not going to run into other people with rifles. Yeah. This isn't going to be some sort of free for all where someone gets shot because they thought but they looked like a deer. Maybe the decision makers that would be involved with this are my age or above and do not perhaps grasp that technology. And, uh, you know, pe people that Possibly. would go out and do yeah, it had to. I you know, I know, I know what you're saying. But I, I, yeah, for me, I, I was that. a few years ago. I was meant to go to Finland, and it was exactly that. Uh, and it wasn't super remote Finland. It was uh, we just had to get a tag for it. It's for a cup of kale, This was, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. 
it, it was it was part of um, the money that I think it was about four hundred euros. I think it wasn't outrageous. And that yeah. uh, five days with I was going to be with a couple of Finnish mates in a wigwam. Uh, that doesn't sound right, but uh, <laughs> in a camp um, with a fire um, and and out there hunting, taking all that stuff out to get you know together and going out and hunting one of these camps. I could only shoot one. I yeah. don't want to shoot any more. And everybody would have a tag, 1,200 euros. Nobody looking after us, only ourselves. People knowing where we were. Like you said, it's, you're given a block. But it's probably, you know, the same as Athol estate size block, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and off you go. And, uh, yeah, England hasn't got those massive areas. But, uh, yeah, just to go and say, shoot, I don't know. But 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 I, I agree with you. England hasn't a, a got a seek a deer in the trough of Boland in a forestry commission block that's seven thousand acres, yeah. um, and when you know there's two people in there and they met at the gate on a on on a Friday afternoon and they had to be out by Sunday evening, and um, and they could shoot a few deer. I, and, but why not? I, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, England doesn't have those big areas. But take Thetford, which I've been to once, and yeah. by Christ, did I see that's a big deer. block, yeah. Thetford's it's a big bit of wood. But yeah. let's take Thetford as an example and say, right, the idea of giving someone a block of Thetford to walk around because of a whole heap of reasons that, you know, I don't know about because I don't know the place. But let's say access is a real issue and there's lots of dog walkers and there's all these things and we don't want people walking around with guns. Why not have a tag system for a high seat? Yeah, yeah. Why couldn't you buy it? Why couldn't you buy a tag to sit in a high seat for a night? Yeah. Like yeah. it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a tag system where you can go into the equivalent of like the Idaho backcountry for three yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if you live in Norwich, yeah. the ability to go and sit in a high seat and pay 30 quid to sit in a high seat for two nights and shoot a munt jack, yeah, that's better than nothing, surely. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. totally agree with you. I mean, Christ, if you think about and if we could if we could envisage those wildlife ranges and their role possibly changing slightly, heaven forbid, yeah. but you know, into more of a sort of um forest hunting manager where they could make sure that Owen was in Owen's high seat at the right time. And the beauty of it is if if Owen turns out to be a bit of a wanderer, you throw him off and you revoke yeah. his tag system. And then yeah. like in America, the fines are horrendous. And because people have this opportunity that they want and they are keen for, they do respect the rules. Yeah. You know, in America, you can be fined extortionate amounts of money for poaching and therefore people just don't do it. And yeah. I think, you know, England is a lot more complicated than Scotland in some ways. Um, yeah. But I don't see an issue when you've got, you know, some of the big forest blocks we've got up here, up at the Borgie and, and a whole heap of other ones. Yeah. Why not divvy them up into stalking beats with clearly defined safety zones or whatever you need? Yeah. Make people wear orange. I don't care. Why not? It doesn't stop them killing deer. Make them wear orange. Make them check in with a ranger on a, you know, when they've shot something at a larder where that animal can be properly recorded and yep. can be made sure is in season and all of these things, you know, have a ranger on hand if needs be to, to assist with extraction or to ensure safety, whatever. But I think the thing is, is, you know, there's there's a few apps now getting into our industry. Hunt Area Management System is yep, a prime that, example yeah. of this, where yep. you can regulate who is on the ground through an app on a mobile phone. That's, that's a, that's, is that a Danish one? Is it a Scandinavian one? Um, I, it's either Scandinavian or Eastern European. Um, yeah. But there's there's a few estates I know using it up here. Um, and I've played around with it a bit. And I can I can easily see, if you had a syndicate of people on a yeah. private estate, or if you had a system like this, if they can build the app, then I'm sure that nine million quid we're spending on deer management, a little bit of that money <laughs> could probably go into pinching the software and doing yeah. something similar. And then if you're in a system where because of the technology we have now, you can safely regulate who is on the ground. And I freely admit, you know, maybe in the 80s, they couldn't do anything like that. So it was dangerous to have people stalking. I, I don't know. But yeah. if you look at the challenges we've got now and the resources that we've got available, unless I'm missing some fundamental thing, I don't understand how they can do it in Finland, they can do it in Norway, they can do it in Denmark, they can do it in America, in Canada, in Mexico, in France. <laughs> And we magically can't because, yeah, you know, nobody's ever presented me with a reason we can't do it other than, oh, um, it's too small. 
And you're yeah. like, well, there's, I think there's six and a half thousand square miles of publicly owned land in Scotland. That's a lot of ground. I, I think, I think the question, I think the commission would come back. It's, it's cost too much to manage that group of people. I think that's what they'd come back with. I'm, I'm, I'm not first question. No, no, I, I, I appreciate no, I that. With the first question, but it, it, it's, I it's, mean, I, and, and that's where, that's where, in an argumentative sense, I look back to that nine million quid. Yeah. And say you can do a lot of stuff with that amount of money. And if we're already failing to meet the objectives and spending that much money, yeah. why, aren't we looking why can't we diversify a little bit yeah. and try something else? Because if you yeah. if you're doing what we're doing at the moment is we continue to fail to meet objectives doing the same thing and not yeah. trying to change yeah. it, which I think is daft. Yeah. But also, you know, if we can get Basque really G'd up about this, if enough people go to Basque and the other organizations and say, We want you to be doing this, we're your members. We want you to be pushing this. Why can't Basque, you know, if Basque have got that pressure on them, and they're only going to do it if the members do pressure them to it, yeah, um, because that's what member organisations do. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I'm sure we can run some sort of trial scheme like they have done on Aaron, which, again, is 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 very close to what we're talking yeah. about, with a higher cost involved. They, they, they will already have the statist- statistics on it, Sam. I think yeah. Thetford, they do it in Thetford, they do it in another place, do it in that, so they'll have the stats on it. But like you say... Yeah. And I, you've got I to get the people behind it and champion it. But that's that's exactly it, and that's that's why I was really keen to come on with you with you today and have a chat yeah. about it because I think you know those of us those of us that are interested in this, and you know, from my point of view, I, 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 I being pl- I, I don't need to do this. No, not I, me. I, you, know, <laughs> you, you and I don't need somewhere to go stalking on a Saturday afternoon. But I came into stalking from a non-stalking family or a rural family, a farming family, but not a shooting family. And it was a huge amount of work from my parents to get me to to where I am today. Uh, And certainly to get me from that age of being, you know, nine, 10 years old to 16 years old uh, with with the experience and, and knowledge that I was fortunate enough to learn because they worked very hard to do that. And I look back on that lad and how much easier it would have been for me to be the the passionate conservationist and, you know, sustainably minded person, which I am entirely because of my profession and, and my yeah. passion for, for deer, really. Yeah. How much easier that would have been if there'd been public land hunting. And I just... You know, there's a good chance that if it had been, actually, I maybe would have ended up with a proper job, like a lawyer or an engineer, (laughs) rather than ending up being wet for half of the year and crawling about in a peat bog. Um, Yeah, and looking forward to rheumatism at 35. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, and Lyme disease. Um, But, you know, I, I think that's it. I think fortunate people as you and I are who, through our through our industry and the, you know, the choices we've made in terms of our career to not require this are probably more aware of the benefits it could bring than a lot of the people that would benefit from it. Yeah. Because, you know, I know how fortunate I am to, to have that access, just, just having that access to the outdoors in a way that really engages me. And I think a lot of the problems we have as a society are because people are not in any way engaged in any sort of ecosystem. It, w- without saying the people that are listening to this podcast will probably agree with me that, you know, deer stalking and, and hunting generally is, in our opinion, probably the best way of engaging with that ecosystem because you're an active part of it. Yep. You know, you can mountain bike through a forest all you damn well please, but you're not going to learn half the amount of stuff you no. do sneaking through there trying to find a road deer or, no, or no. find a secret, or whatever it is. And I think, you know, we, we have a huge problem with food and where food comes from and people's engagement with that and how do we excite children about it. And even in even in areas, you know, very rural areas as I am now, you know, the kids that are growing up in the village in, in Akhnashin that go to the, to the primary school, you know, a, a lot more natural a childhood definitely than my friend that grew up in in the inner city of Birmingham um but do they have any more opportunities possibly but not really if you you know there's more chance that some kid in that school's dad knows a deer stalker or a gamekeeper than people that grow up in Birmingham absolutely but do they have many better opportunities possibly not and 
and yet it's there. You know, there's forests around here where deer are managed and are controlled purely as uh, as a forest exercise, like they are on the public land uh, yeah. and the public estate. And, you know, we're, I don't think this is something, and it sounds, I don't know, perhaps it sounds slightly hypocritical to be wanting to roll this out on ground that isn't mine, where I'm not responsible for the deer on. But I think the, av- the answer to that is that it's owned by the people that need these opportunities. It is the public land. Yeah. It's the public yeah. estate. Yeah. Um, and it, it it is generally delivering commercial forestry for the public, apparently, or a native woodland for the greater good. Um, so why can it not also be producing a fantastic local meat as well as a great source of exercise, engagement with the natural world, and and fun for the yeah. public as well? It seems very counterintuitive to me that yeah, all yeah. these public lands, unless you want to go mountain biking through it, in which case, fine, yeah. But for anything else, it's off limits to you. You can't which, go which, off. which, yeah, but that you don't have to pay for, and you don't. Yeah, get back no. Can you imagine? I mean, we're talking about a tag system, and I don't think there's anybody who would expect these tags for free. No. Can you imagine if if you had to get a mountain biking tag to yeah. go and use the public forest? You know, yeah. we're we're such a. I think in a lot of cases, without meaning to play the the tiny fiddle, we're such a hard done to community of people yeah. that we're. Yeah. We're trying to find a way to pay to access land that we already own. And we're <laughs> excited by that, you know, <laughs> it, which is mad in so many ways. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I, I think the whole way that, you know, it's interesting you're talking about Finland because I, I have quite a few Scandinavian clients come over and the relationship that the, the every man has with nature there is so different to this country. <laughs> Um, and a lot of that is to do with their access law, what they call the every man's right to, to yeah. go and, and enjoy nature. And yeah. as long as it's done responsibly, harvest mushrooms, apply for hunting tags, whatever it is. Um, we've really lost that in that country or we never had it or, or whatever. Um, and I think if you look at those, you know, where those countries are in terms of delivering climate change objectives, all of these things are tied in. Yeah. If people care about their environment Absolutely. because they're invested in it, they look after it and they're in, they're, they're bothered about it. And I think, I think I think there's a bigger awareness now. I mean, I, I certainly get a lot more um, people wanting to come out deer stalking, as you say, from no shooting background now because they're finding venison via the the um, they're they're wanting to eat better quality food and know where it's coming from, you know, would rather buy their eggs from the the, the, the box at the end of the farmyard or the local, you know, uh, small old inn. Uh, and I, I have quite a few people now that it isn't about what, you know, even what breed they're shooting, they would like to harvest something with me and and then take it away. And and it's, it's a, you know, that's only the last three or four years that's changed and yeah no i, I, that, that I couldn't customer's agree definitely there isn't it but yeah and I, I, it's really interesting i always i always find it funny because um my father for example has like a very a very british view of of american hunters and yeah. um all of the negativities around american hunters and i've i've worked in some places where i've seen the nth degree of trophy hunting. I've seen people come from Texas who had a decision to shoot a red stag in a fence in Texas or a red stag in Scotland, and they've chosen to come to Scotland. But at that Dallas Safari Club meeting, they were offered both. And um, I've met those people. I've spent time with those people. But I've also have a, I, I have one, uh, my probably my favourite American client that's ever turned up was a guy who was based uh, down in England on a Navy base. He worked for the American Navy. He was called Schmitty, really nice guy. He's talked to me a couple of times. Uh, and he turned up um, and the back of his car had a cool box in it. And he would not have left without what he shot. There was yeah. no way on earth he was going to shoot yeah. a deer and leave yeah. it hanging in the chiller. Yeah. And he, he stalked with me and, you know, he shot a stag and a roebuck and he took the roebuck and half the stag with him. And yeah. it was as much about a that pleasure. Year as that, that hunt of a lifetime in Scotland yeah. Yeah. because he was stationed here. Um, you know, he, he, he t- yes, he took, and he got a full shoulder mount done of the stag and the roebuck. Yeah. Um, but he but was every bit there's, bothered there's about no, the carpets. There's no meat market in, uh, in the States, is it? You're shooting. No, not at all. And, not at all. Um, and, and if they're shooting a lot, they just have quite a few freezers. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. If, you know, that's, and he was... I, 
I think he's from New Jersey or Maryland originally, so a real white tail state. Yeah. Um, and he was, you know, he was, he, they shot sort of a few bucks and a few does in his sort of family group of guys that went hunting. And, um, and he was like, he, he was so astounded that we have people that travel here in a car to come hunting. And yet, and I genuinely um, do, and this is moving away from the public land thing a little bit, but I, I tend to hold estates and providers responsible because you can't blame people for not wanting to take an 80 yeah. kilogram stag away yeah, in your yeah. skin when they yeah. probably haven't got butchery facilities or storage facilities. Yeah. And it's really on us. And this is, you know, again, this is probably taken three years for me to get around to, but you know, I'm lucky that now in a position with the estate's help that we'll be able to sell venison, butchered venison direct to the, the stalking client or the holiday let client for them to take yeah. away a, a portion of, of, of as they like. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that we, we, we as an industry have been slow getting behind. Um, it's been damaging to us to have people coming stalking and not taking any venison because a fundamental part of what we're doing is a meat harvest yep. and, you know, a paying client to come and not, not really be able with the best will in the world, yep. you know, practically all right. We, in principle, they can buy it for the same as a dealer rate and take it away. Yep. Um, but realistically, how many people is that achievable for? And and fair play to the ones that do, because I've always had some clients that will make a point of taking a hind or, you yeah, know, a calf whatever. Or yeah. yeah, yeah. But but really, it's, I think, as provided... They want 150 kilos of smelly stag, though. <laughs> well, exactly. And, you know, we're lucky in a way that that run, run stag has a real market in, you know, in the in the salami-making business in yeah. Europe and everything yeah, else. Yeah. Um, but you know that's an interesting thing. Should we be shooting stags in the rut, or should we be pushing people to come and shoot stags late July, August, when the venison is at its prime? Yeah, and yeah. the stalking, actually, you know, I have this conversation with people every year about you know when should I come stalking, and the general answer is the best time is the last week in September and the that's first two weeks in October, <laughs> and that's what we tell people because that's when um, that's when the rut is. That's when, um, and you know, like everything, this all goes back to William yeah, Scrope yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and our origins of, of when, you know, stags were at their prime. When did they look the most monarch of the glen? Yeah. When were they roaring? And there is no denying that that period of the year is, is one of my favourites. And it's yeah. definitely one of the most impressive times to be amongst a deer herd. Um, but actually, if I, if I was having a chat with a mate of mine, actually, uh, a little while ago who did his apprenticeship as a, a stalker on a, a very traditional Highland estate, a phenomenal deer forest, um, and is now uh, now a, a grouse keeper uh, and a good one. But, um, you know, he's he's been away from the deer for maybe half a dozen years, eight years, nine years, and we were chatting about um, just, just it. And he said to me, he said, you know, the one thing I really miss is those early August days when you're right, the deer are right on the high tops out of the flies. It's always a big day's walk. You've got a lot of light in the day to play with as a stalker. You're not going, oh, I can't get out there and get back today. You can go right out to the march and work your way back in. He said, they're the days I miss. Those days with the horse, going out early yeah. August, shooting stags that might still be in the velvet, yeah. but are high up, are hard to stalk. They're in big herds. Yeah. You know, and then, and this is what makes me what makes me really appreciate the, the content we get from overseas. And you look at, you know, meat eater is a prime example that, you know, those guys will go and hunt a caribou herd in the far reaches of, of Nova Scotia or wherever the hell they are. And yeah. then they're talking about these, these vast herds on the tops of mountains. And you're like, Oh, we've kind of got that. It's not the yeah. same, but yeah. it's pretty damn close. Yeah. And, and Scotland, especially in and England too, the variety of, of hunting we've got, and the the variety of terrain we've got is, is really special. And I think there's a real shame. And, you know, I've got guys that have been coming stalking up here for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and they've always come at the same time of year, and they always experience one type of, of open hill yeah. red deer stalking, whereas I'd love to get some of those guys up in early August. 
I think you also think hard horn, but in the last few years, that that rut thing has kind of slipped a few weeks now, hasn't it? And you can get it, it's you it's know, fascinating. Me booking, me booking class. Oh, I want to come the end of August, and you know the stags haven't even split at the end. Uh, sorry, at end of September, and the stags haven't even split, and that's like. Yeah. Yeah, there's no well, in it, in it, and you're almost getting to the I, end of your season. What was I at Letter U? Uh, Prime Rock, middle of October. Yeah, that would be that would be three. So uh, three seasons ago, I was um, at an estate uh, far west coast, probably one of the most um, fantastic places I've ever been lucky enough to work. Uh, an estate called Letter U, Fisherfield Wilderness, just amazing, truly wild com- country. I think we had nine Munros, uh, uh, just amazing. Um, but that year we basically didn't have a rut until the second week of the hind season. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. I, I think it was the tenth of November that it really kicked Something, off. Yeah, it's um, no, no, yeah, it would, it would be. It was. I'm sure I've got the tenth of November in my head. You know, all the way through the stag season, they just didn't break out, and that was that year we had a really hot summer, yeah. and the grazing was good high up, and they just didn't have an interest in breaking. Um, and so those guys that have booked those October weeks, rightly enough, it was midge free, which is a good reason to come later in the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, you know, they, they didn't get that rut stalking them, but they all had a good time. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it, I think as we develop as an industry, and we're, like I said right at the start, we're in this fascinating time of change. We're looking at potentially no longer having a, a legal stag season. Um whether that will open, uh, whether that will open the deer up to exploitation commercially round the year, you know, who knows whether we'll see sort of management stalking being offered in May and June. I've no idea. Yeah, um, yeah, right, right. But <laughs> you know, we're at this time of change, so let's a yeah. let's push for some public land hunting. Let's you know, let's really go for change. If we're going to have to change anyway, bugger it. Let's really fire on hammer and tongs. So- but also. If clients look at different times of year and different experiences, I think they'll get so much more out of it. Um, yeah. You know, Christ, I've I've had I've had days in February shooting hinds at the very end of the season where I've been in my shirt sleeves, and yeah. I've actually there's a picture that that well I've taken it down because we're about to move house, but there's a picture in the bathroom here uh, of a mate of mine stood uh, stood on an island. We were doing a hind cover right at the end of the season, the first year I was self employed, and he stood there with his rifle on his back, very uh, like typical um highland stalking picture really i suppose but he was up there and the number of people that come out it's just a nice picture and the number of people that come out of the downstairs loo when they're visiting and go oh that that picture of the summertime just amazing and i thought i was taken on the like 8th of february yeah and people don't yeah. believe it but yeah <laughs> amazing stalking available then and just we're, we're so lucky in scotland that we've got this massive variety of experiences for yeah. people um, I, I, I love scotland and I, I can never get up there enough and it's uh, I, had, I had some uh, stalking on Quintar, say for twenty four years. Uh, we lost it three four years ago when they sold the forest, which was heartbreaking to be honest. But uh, I used to love going up there; it's just fantastic. But but Sam, I mean, we've been gassing on for about an hour and a half. I mean, this is my longest. Heaven forbid. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening. To you. That's what it has. I've been listening to you. It's for for a guy of. 28, 29 years old, I've, I've your experience and your your opinion, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm I'm I've got a list of stuff to continue on, but <laughs> I feel well, we should for, for our listeners yeah, absolutely. I just, wanna, would you it'll come have on got again? most of them to sleep, I'm sure. I, I, I want to talk way. about I want to talk about copper ammunition. I want to talk about so much I want to chat to you about. So I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on. Thank you so much. Can we make a date in a few months' time to come back on? Absolutely, mate. Yeah, I'd That's love a podcast that. Podcast legend. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I um I hope people have people have managed to stay awake and um I'm, well, uh, I'm terrible. I'm a terrible chatterbox when I get going. I think it's because there's not many people. My, to listen, talk to listen, listen. My my key listener, from what I understand from feedback, is British lads loading bullets late at night. And <laughs> that could right, be if, if I come on again, hours. we can be really, we can be really boring and talking about concentricity <laughs> gauges and all sorts of shit. Oh no, well, we can do that for them, can't we? <laughs> but listen, I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate your time. Uh, as I said at the start. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to somebody who, who isn't um, uh, somebody I've known for years and uh, who I don't really know. I've enjoyed getting to know you and uh, I, I have the uh, equal amount of passion 
the Scotland that you do, um, mine based over years coming, yours based over years of working up there. And I wish you every success in your new job. Maybe that's very much. give you a shout and see how you're getting on with it. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I hope you stay safe and stay healthy, all the family. Good luck with the move. Let's stay in touch uh, and I wish you all the best. Thanks very much, Owen. A real pleasure, mate. Thank you very much, mate. Take care. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye.